And with that, I would now like to introduce our next presenter. So Paolo from our a collaborator from the Technical University of Denmark. Um, Paolo will be presenting the structure tools, Lyra and Scepter. So Paolo, I'll let you take it away. Yep, thank you, Nina. And I'll just share my screen. Um, Here. Um, can you see the slides? Yes, all good. Super. Then I will. Uh, I will start. So, first of all, thank you all for uh, asking me to to have this presentation. This is something that is uh, usually Morton's uh, pleasure to do, um, but he asked me to to do this this year. I'm actually the one that it's more involved into uh, working with structures at DTU. Uh, so I was very happy to do that. Um, and thanks, Morten, for the slides. We'll go through these two uh, different tools, uh, Lyra and Scepter. Uh, the main uh, idea of those tools that are, these are, give you the ability to uh, identify a solvent structure of um, lymphocyte receptors, so B cell and T cell receptors in complex with their antigen, and also to model those. We'll start with SEPTOR, that is a structural complexes of uh, epitope receptor. Uh, that is a, a, a tool to identify and retrieve solid structure for um, antibodies and T cell receptors in complex with MHCs and MHC in complex with peptide. Let's, uh, let's start by looking at I mean, where they are in the, in the results page of IEDB. Um, here, the main idea is that um, we want to be able to, uh, to analyze and to retrieve uh, 3D structures of these complexes. And even though uh, the, the complexes or the, the, the epitopes for which we have uh, one or more solvent structures uh, are a small minority in comparison to the ones for which uh, we have other experimental data available. Those are very important, not only because they provide a unique uh, information that it's a structural information, but also because they are of a high value to train novel methods for uh, predicting epitopes, for predicting uh, MHC binders and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, so the main idea is that you want to be able to have some flexibility in the uh, selection of the uh, structure that you, uh, you retrieve. So first of all, let's have a quick look at what are B cell and T cell receptors. And um, most of you will know this, but this is, I usually like to spend some time on this because it's, uh, it's quite fascinating the way in which uh, antibodies and T cell receptor binds to their antigen. And you see uh, here, on, oh, here on the left, you can see um, the structure of a T cell receptor that it's in the upper part in, uh, in gray, uh, that is binding to uh, a peptide presented by an MHC uh, complex. And you see that uh, the, the region that it's involved in the binding are a few loops that are actually the CDR3, the CDR loops from the uh, alpha and beta chain uh, that bind both to the peptide that is in orange in the middle of the, the figure and to the, um, to the MHC chain that it's in this uh, uh, violet uh, blue color. Um, on the other, on the right hand uh, of, the, of the figure, we see um, the actual um, T cell receptor from the perspective of the of the antigen, and you you can see that you have the three the CDR loop, CDR one, two, and three for the alpha and beta chain, where the CDR three loops sit in the middle of the of the binding side, and the other two loops are on the periphery of the binding side. So why is this important? Uh, at this here, we also develop a lot of uh, uh, tools for predicting epitopes, anti antibody, also B cell epitopes and T cell epitopes. But most of the tools that we have developed so far are um, agnostic of the specific receptor that binds to them. 
in some cases, this is exactly what you what you need. So you want to, for example, to know if uh, if a given peptide is presented by an MHC molecule, that's perfectly fine. But in many cases, uh, the question becomes a bit fuzzy. So for example, if you look for a, a B-cell epitope, uh, what you're actually asking is, does it, does it exist one of the possible infinite in uh, infinite number of uh, of pizza receptor that actually binds to this specific antigen or to this specific epitope and this question is very broad because we know that in many cases almost everything can be uh, an antigen in, in in given the good conditions so it's quite interesting actually to be able to develop new tools that tell you or something more. So they can tell you if a given T cell receptor or a given B cell receptor binds to a specific epitope. Uh, so basically what we what you can do with Scepter is, is to be able to, to retrieve the data to, to study these and to develop uh, new tools. But it, uh, it's also important to notice one thing. So when you develop tools or when you analyze data, as, as we were hearing just a few minutes before, you have to be very careful because uh, it's very easy to do a thing that in, in tool development and machine learning is called uh, overfitting. That means that the tool that you develop is uh, actually, uh, uh, let's say, driven very strongly by the data set that you have. So if you have a bias in the data set or if you have um, you know, some data of poor quality in the data set, this will affect the ability of your tool to perform good prediction and to generalize. Generalize means that the tool doesn't work uh, well on data that it's quite different uh, to the data that you've, used, you've been using to train. So this is a very important point. And whenever you want to select a tool uh, for predicting epitopes, for predicting any kind of uh, immunological property, it's very important that you are uh, sure that the tool has not been trained on a data set that is too redundant. And this is the case for the tools that you have at IDB and that uh, we develop uh, together with them also. So um, the redundancy is pretty common in the, in the data sets that we have. For example, in this case, uh, that it's quite similar to what we were just uh, hearing before, uh, you will see that this uh, CDR3 from, uh, from beta chain, TCR, uh, TCR receptor beta chains, uh, all target the same epitope that is here. And you see that you have plenty of uh, CDR3 with only minor differences, all, all of them binding to the same epitope. So this is usually not a good sign when you want to, uh, to have an unbiased data set. And the other way around, it's also true. So very often you see that you might have a single CDR3 binding to several slightly different versions of the same epitope. Now, uh, for this reason, SEPTER was developed. SEPTER is a, it's a database of TCR PMHC 3D complexes. Actually, you can also download other type of structure from there. And it gives you um, quite a few uh, Flexibility it gives you quite a quite a nice flexibility to be able to download uh, structures with good quality and with reduced redundancy. Now you will be able to find here uh, all the tabs, and we'll go through some of them. And let's start with the TCR tab. So this is uh, uh, the the tab in which uh, you can uh, uh, identify. Uh, structure of a T cell receptor in complex with peptide MHC complexes. Now, you have a few parameters that you can tune in order to um, to improve or to to tune your query here. First one is the resolution. The resolution is a measure of the quality of the experimental data when you have uh, X-ray structures. That it's the vast majority of the of the uh, structure for um, these kind of uh, molecules. And uh, if you are not familiar with these numbers, I would, the resolution is a number that is, uh, is measured in Angstrom and the, the lower the better. So when, when people say high resolution, it actually means a low number here. Three is a, is a usually a good threshold to, to discriminate between good structures and not so good structures. And um, 
in general, uh, I would say that everything that it's below two, it's quite good. Between two and three, it's it's still good. So uh, here you can just, for example, leave this uh, this number that is three. Then you have another num number that it's a R three factor that is also uh, indicative of, of of the quality of the structure. If, uh, if we compare a crystal structure to a to a picture, the resolution of the crystal structure is actually similar to the resolution of a, of a picture. So how many pixels you have. Uh, DR3 is actually a number that it's connected to how much in focus your picture is. So if, uh, if you have a picture of, you know, my kids, they're always moving, they're never in focus. So even though the resolution might be quite good, DR3 uh, is not so good. So this is all, another way to uh, remove structures of, uh, of poor quality. Finally, you also might have that some parts of the, of the structures are not visible in the experiment be because of technical problems or because they move too much. And uh, uh, the third option here uh, allows you to select if you want also to include uh, T-cell receptor with missing residues in their CDR. And usually to, to be on the safe side, you can say, okay, I, I don't want to include those, but in some cases you, you don't care. So you can include them in your data set. Then the most interesting part is about the epitope features. So you can select epitopes, both of uh, peptides, so peptidic nature and non-peptidic. And more, the vast majority of the structures are for classical uh, peptidic um, uh, epitopes. If you select a peptide as, uh, as the type, you can also select the length of the peptide. And this is the filtering part that I was telling you before. You can also uh, cluster the uh, epitopes based on their similarity. So you can select the similarity threshold and uh, uh, the fact if you want to, to cluster based on the um, on the core or uh, on the uh, on the all um, uh, epitope sequence, and uh, we've discussed before that this is not so relevant for for class one. It's more relevant for class two, in which the core is uh, uh, only a part of the of the uh, peptide. And finally, you can also filter based on organism and on the class of the MHC. Here. If you press submit, you get to a page that's like this. Uh, you've seen quite a few of those, so you, you might be familiar now. And you have here an identifier of the cluster. And uh, these identifiers that basically telling you all the information that you need. Uh, of uh, the epitope that your uh, that, that specific sample is uh, uh, representing the TCR and the MHC. So the first number is the epitope. In this case, it's a, it's a ID that it's for, and you see that also in this column. You see that the epitope ID is the same for for the three of them. If you have a, a reduced uh, redundancy threshold. 70, 60, you will have cases in which you have the same number here that it's four that is connected to different epitope IDs that are similar but not identical. Then you have uh, some identifiers connected to the TCR alpha and beta chain. So for example, we can see here in this case that these first two samples have the same alpha and beta chain and also the MHC uh, molecule, the last one. As usual, uh, all the links, all the all the information, it's a, it's a hyperlink to uh, other pages in the um, ITP uh, database, and you can click on those. You can click on this uh, view 3D structure, and the 3D structure will be visualized in another in another page using a, a small uh, JavaScript uh, plugin, and you can uh, also highlight. Uh, some of the characteristics or, or, or the features that you want to look uh, into the structure itself. So 
uh, the epitope or the, the PCR or the epitope residues or, or um, contacts between the different parts of the molecule. You also have a link, an external link to the PDB protein data bank that it's the main source for uh, um, solvent structures. Now, if you go to, to the next tab, you, you have something similar, but for MHC molecules. And again, it's more or less all the same. Uh, what changes here is that, again, you can select peptidic or non-peptidic. If you select the peptidic um, uh, option, you will be able to filter based on length and on sequence identity. And again, you go to a very similar page in which uh, all the peptide MHC uh, structures are uh, reported following the, the query that you have uh, um, submitted. Uh, I think it's pretty much the same here. And finally, we go to the uh, B-cell receptors antibody page. And again, it's quite similar. In this case, the antigen is not a peptide, it's either proteins or, or small molecules or in a few cases peptides. So you can, in, in this case, select things uh, based on the, on the epitope type, peptidic or non-peptidic. And uh, the antigen length in this case uh, is, is a number that is larger, that it's discriminating between proteins and peptides, for example. And again, you can still uh, uh, cluster things by sequence identity. I think this is pretty much the same. Again, so as, as for web sin in the other page, you have a cluster ID that it's identifying the antigen based on the sequence identity that you selected, heavy chain, light chain, epitope. Now, uh, as I was telling you before, the, the number of uh, epitopes for which we have at least one uh, solvent structure is pretty minute in comparison to the, all the other experimental data. But the good thing is that you can actually model uh, quite a few of those uh, uh, sequences using another tool that we have de developed a few years back, that it's LIRA. Uh, LIRA stands for Lymphocyte Receptor Automated Modeling. So as the name tells, it's a tool that it's almost completely automated. And we have heard uh, from a, a lot of people think about the huge diversity that you observe in all of these molecules. So MHC are uh, uh, highly diverse, uh, but also T cell receptor and B cell receptors have uh, some regions in particular that are very, uh, very diverse. And in general, when you have sequence uh, di diversity in, uh, in the molecules that you want to, to model, for which you want to create a structural model, that's not a good, a good sign because uh, the more diversity you have in terms of sequence, the harder it is to get a good structural model. And uh, for B cell receptor and T cell receptor, that would be terrible because the most variable part are the CDRs and the CDRs are the ones that are uh, deciding the function or, or dictating the function of the, of the molecule. So you would have a, a molecule that it's accurate or, or good in, in a region that you don't really care that it's the conserved framework region and that it's not as good exactly where you need it to be precise. But fortu fortunately, this is, uh, uh, has been proven not to be the case. Uh, in the 80s, uh, Cyrus Chalthy and Arthur Lesk discovered that despite the high sequence diversity of the CDR loops, they uh, usually only can uh, get into a very limited set of conformation that can be uh, predicted by the length of the CDR loops and by looking at specific residues within and outside the loop itself. And those are called canonical structures. So this is actually uh, why we can predict the structure of antibodies and TSR receptor to a very good accuracy. And this, in the, this is the main interface for LIRA. As you see, it's very simple. You only have to put in two chains, uh, uh, first chain and second chain. As you see here, it doesn't matter. It can be heavy chain and light chain or the other way around, light chain and heavy chain. It doesn't matter the order or alpha and beta. Uh, you need both of them and they need to be 
um, uh, amino acid sequences. So you can either uh, um, input FASTAL sequences or just uh, rule sequences without the header. That works, but they have to be amino acidic. And uh, uh, what LIDAR does is that takes those sequences and uh, will uh, exploit uh, the um, canonical structure method to model the loops. It will do a so-called homology modeling for the other regions, and then it will assemble everything into a, so the, the, a single model. The template, so the part that it's uh, uh, conserved uh, are identified using the Blossom 62 scores obtained from a Blossom 62 matrix that we've heard before. And uh, whenever the template that is identified for the conserved region does uh, not uh, have loops that are compatible with the canonical structures that are predicted to be present in the, in the uh, target sequence, LIRA will select new loops that are compatible based on their canonical structure with uh, uh, the best uh, Blossom 62 score. So as you see, I was mentioning that before, you can input the, uh, either FASTA or row sequences in the two boxes, no matter what is the um, order. You also have uh, a few advanced options that are uh, in general, I mean, it's, it's safe to, to keep them to the default value. Uh, they are used for sidechain modeling. Um, even though the loops are uh, conserved because of this canonical structure uh, thingy that way that I was mentioning, uh, this is uh, only restricted to the main chain, so to the to the backbone of the of the protein. Side chains actually can vary, and uh, in order to model them, you have a few options. One is to use uh, uh, Hammer and Skrull. They, these are Hammer is the tool that it's used to uh, create the alignment between your targeted and the template. And if on a given amino acid is conserved, uh, so it's exactly the same in the targeted and the template, uh, that uh, the side chain of that amino acid will just be copied. If there is a different amino acid, then this tool that uh, that is a scroll 4.0 that it's developed by Roland Dambrek will be used to model the side chain. And uh, you also have this uh, option to blacklist PDB. And this is usually not very, uh, I mean, commonly done by, 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 by users. Uh, there are two cases in which you want to do these. One is for testing purposes. So you want to uh, predict uh, the, the structure of a, of a um, antibody or a tissue receptor for which you have to solve the structure then you blacklist it and you see how good the model will perform, or you know that a given solvent structure has something that you don't like and you, you don't want to use it as a, as a template. You submit and you get to a page in which you have a few um, uh, different output. One is just the sequence that you've uh, uh, submitted. You have a table in which all the templates that have been selected for the different region are, are listed and you see that uh, you get up to um, nine templates for a single structure. Um, and then you have the alignment that was used to create the, the model. And this is also useful because you can see what is the sequence similarity between target and template. And uh, that is usually a good proxy or a good way to, to uh, estimate the accuracy of the model. And you can also visualize the model online. And this is uh, uh, the expected accuracy for P cell receptor and T cell receptor. So here we have in green uh, on the X axis, we have the different regions of the uh, antibodies and uh, T cell receptor. So CDR1, 2, and 3 of the light chain, of the heavy chain, of the alpha chain, and of the beta chain. And then uh, the number of, uh, of uh, structure for which a model with a very good RMSD. RMSD means root mean square deviation, that it's the distance between the model and the real structure. Uh, if it's less than one, this is a very good RMSD. And you can see that in most of the cases you get that at least 50% of the models have a very good um, RMSD or a good one. 
that it's between one and two. Uh, there is one exception, and those are the CDR3. The CDR3 are a bit harder to model, and you can see that for the heavy chain, CDR3 of the heavy chain, and also for the CDR3 of the alpha and beta chain, you get somewhat lower accuracy. Uh, so this is one of the main fields in which we are working hard in order to get better methods uh, out. You can also see that in general, the accuracy for T cell receptor is slightly lower than for B cell receptor. And this is due to the fact that you we have, I would say, a, approximately 2000 antibody structures in the PDB where we have probably a couple of hundred T cell receptor structures. So uh, as time will uh, will pass and we'll get most of the structure, we believe that the, also the, the accuracy for T cell receptor will be on par uh, with that observed for B cell receptors. And Paolo, the, just a quick note, four minutes left. Sure, great. So I will just close to show a couple of ways in which these uh, things can be used to improve epithet prediction. And we have published a couple of papers of, one paper is on, on a further development of, of Lyra to model TCR PMHC com, uh, complexes. So to model the old thing, TCR receptor peptide MHC. And uh, we have been using this tool to create models to see whether we could, can improve the prediction of uh, uh, binding partners. So we have a TCR receptor and we have a pool of peptides, MHC complexes. Can we identify which peptide uh, PMHC complex binds to that specific TCR receptor and the other way around? So uh, we have sequenced data. We create models for all these uh, uh, T cell receptor and for all the uh, peptide MHC. And we try to put them together using TCR PMHC models, this tool that was published last year. So basically we, pay, we try to pair all of them together. Uh, after we do this, we can calculate the energy of binding using a few tools. Uh, uh, we have used in this paper, uh, the Rosetta energy full field, force field and the full dicks and uh, force field. <coughs> and then we try to tune this energy function in order to optimize the um, predictive power of what we have in a very simple way. So basically, uh, again, as uh, also Bjorn was mentioning before, we didn't want to use uh, something that was very complicated because it's easier than to uh, Yes, to, to fool ourselves and to overfit the method that then doesn't really work in, uh, uh, in new cases. And you can see here in this that it's the so-called uh, uh, rock curve. Uh, and it's a curve that it's telling you how good a method is, uh, uh, how accurate the method is. And we see that the complete model that it's the one part uh, plus politics as this curve that deviates quite a lot from the diagonal here, the diagonal would be a random model. So the higher the curve goes, the better a model is. And we can see that actually we can improve quite a lot. And if we have a task in which we, as I was mentioning before, we want to identify binding partners. So we have a few peptide MHC complexes and we ask, okay, who's this guy binding? Who's, the, who's this this receptor binding? Uh, we can see that on one end, uh, we can use the, I mean, all tools, NetMHC, NetMHC PAN, to see, uh, for example, the binding affinity of the peptide to the MHC. But we know that this is only one part of the problem. Now, if we include the other part, so we also include the TCR binding, uh, can, can we increase the predictive power? And here we have done so. Oh. So uh, we have two different scores. One is all, all the, the one for the TCR binding alone. The other is for the MHC binding alone. We see that the MHC binding alone on the, on the, um, the right has quite a high uh, accuracy. But by including information on the structure and on the TCR binding, we can actually discriminate between the real binders and uh, uh, no real binders. And this can be used, for example, in uh, computational epithet of discovery. You can model uh, antibody sequences, antigen sequences, putting them together using different tools that are listed in this slide. 
and then identify, for example, which design uh, is better, um, increase its, uh, its uh, affinity by using computational tools and computational force field, then do some experiments and, and repeat this cycle in order to get a high affinity uh, antibody and tissue receptor. So to sum it up, um, I presented to you uh, these two tools, Scepter and Lyra. Scepter is a tool to provide access to solid structure of the BCIL receptor and TCR receptor in complex uh, with their epitope. And uh, the tools allows to select structure of uh, um, the quality that the user desires to, 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 to have, and also the redundancy that the user wants to have. If no solid structure is available, there is another possibility it's to model the structure and you can do that with Lyra. Uh, the accuracy of, of Lyra is very good uh, overall. Uh, the only culprit is the, the modeling of the CDR3 um, uh, loops. But in many cases, especially if the loops are not too long, the results are quite good. And um, when you are in kind of difficult cases, that that would be either very long CDR3 loops or uh, antibodies and these are receptor for non-human and non-mouse origin for which we have a limited set of, of uh, template structure, other tools uh, are available. And uh, with this I finished and I leave the word to Nina. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paolo, for that. Um, we will move into the next Q&A section. So we'll have just under 15 minutes and I would like to invite Bjorn and Will back. Um, Paolo, while you take a look at the q and I might throw it over to Bjorn to perhaps kick us off with um, the first question. Okay. Just pulling the first one up. Um, and I went uh, during the other talks, I went through and tried to answer all the leftover questions or um, as much, much as I could from the previous session. So uh, one is kind of a leftover, which I thought is important is uh, which method is better to remove MHC predictions with overlap. You mentioned to choose 50 mares with 10 mare overlap. Why not try a longer peptide covering more prediction stakes? So the ultimate uh, approach for a longer peptide would be why not just use the whole protein? And that is a perfectly reasonable approach. Um, the advantage of using a shorter peptide is that you actually know what the specific epitopes is, A, and B, it's a um, synthesis issue. Uh, you can make 50 mer peptides for uh, like 10 bucks or so. Uh, if you're synthesizing a whole protein, you wanna make sure that you have the right one, you're looking at thousands. Um, so uh, with the uh, 50 mer peptides, you can make them fast, reliably, and they're gonna be accurate. The longer you get, the more likely you're gonna make a synthesis mistake. That's a, a very practical reason. And then the other is again, like if you wanna do targeted uh, epitopes, say you wanna make sure that it includes the mutation and you don't want to uh, in, in cancer, or you want to make sure that you're really targeting the, um, you, you, if you do vaccine design, you wanna make sure that you're uh, inducing a response exactly against the regions that you know is important in a virus and that doesn't have, uh, um, yeah. So, so that's the reason for going short, but there's nothing wrong with going longer and there's, there's reasonable things for it specifically if synthesis cost is not a concern. Um, and I, I saw like a, 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 maybe we can uh, do a round robin. Uh, Will, you have some chance to look at things and then Paolo can come back. And then I, I saw plenty of things I could answer, um, but uh, yeah, let's uh, take, a, take turns. Will? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I see a question. Um, has the TCR region that interacts with the residues in the HLA molecule been determined? Is it a concrete region as the uh, CDR3 beta for the epitope residues, or are they different regions of uh, the TCR chains that interact with the HLA? Um, right, so I, I think the, it's the general consensus is that CDRs uh, one and two are the ones that interact with uh, the MHC or the HLA molecule. Um, I think that's, uh, I think CDR2 especially is known to interact directly with that. So um, yeah, thanks for your question. Uh, I think I'll take one and then Paolo. Yep, uh, sure. So th the next one, uh, what kind of data were the processing models cleavage and TAP traditionally trained on 
before elution binding data? Is there data in IDB? So um, no, that data is often not in the IDB. There were separate papers that are doing proteasomal digests and transport affinity assays. There's references in the papers that I pointed out. And if you have trouble finding the data, email me. I think I still have uh, access to most of them. Uh, so those were uh, the reason why they're not in the IDB is because they're not really epitope data, right? So you have like a protein and the cleavage fragments made from it, or you have tab transport data for peptides that may or may not be epitopes. So that data is unfortunately not in the IDB. Uh, Paolo? Yes, maybe I can answer. There's not a lot of question on structures, but I can answer a question on what is the logic for choosing an A and M for prediction rather than other machine learning methods? And I think, I mean, this is a quite general question here. Uh, there are two things. So some machine learning tools are more prone to overfit. Uh, so I would say that with, with neural networks, you have more control on, on yes, being sure that you're not over, overfitting. So basically that your tool will work on a large number of cases and not only on something that is similar. To, um, to your data set. And this is one part that's very important. I would say that in general, it's not as important which tool you use, but how you process the data for training. And this is something, I mean, you can, doesn't matter if you use deep learning, if your data set is uh, highly biased. Uh, that being said, some tools are, I would say a little bit of an edge on, on the others and neural networks and deep, uh, networks in these uh, last few years have been uh, the, the first choice for a lot of uh, uh, problems. So uh, yes, that's my answer. I would say that there is not a strong preference of uh, neural networks, but they, they make it easier to control redundancy and to avoid overfitting. Um, I think I see another one for TCR match. Um, does the TCR match training data set uh, also contain cancer and HIV epitopes and TCRs? Uh, the answer to that is no, um, but it's a, a, it, um, something I want to point out is that when we do have the tool um, available as a standalone download, you will be able to uh, download it and run it against whatever data set you want if you do have a cancer or HIV data set. Um, you can customize it if you download the tool and then just tell it you want to compare similarity between your input sequences and uh, a data set that is cancer or HIV related. So uh, keep that in mind uh, for when the tool does go live. Thanks. Okay, I'll do two questions. What is the training data set used for the immunogenicity predictor? Is it the full IDB? Otherwise, how big is the data set? Where all the different assays for T-cell reactive included or only a refined set? So this has been a while back that that tool was developed. Uh, back then, yes, it was an attempt to get all of the data from the IADB, um, uh, but there were certain restrictions of what we consider to be higher quality data sets. Ideally, you would go to the paper and find out exactly what they are. And actually we had several data sets um, uh, for testing and validation for the same reasons as before. This has actually been validated uh, also continuously over time. We were actually surprised how well it's been holding up um, as really something independent of MHC binding that helps with immunogenicity prediction, even if not so much, but uh, we are quite confident that it, it works. Um, yeah, uh, I guess, again, like the, the fast, uh, not the, the, the best answer is please read the paper. This, um, it's not completely trivial. We have found in general using the IADB T cell data sets is a little challenging. Uh, in, com in contrast to MHC binding data or structural data, you really do have quite a divergence of assay types and it, it might be throwing it all together in one uh, is, is, more, is less satisfying and can sometimes be um, problematic. As more data comes in, we hope that's gonna get better. So the second question I wanted to talk about, so both MHC1 and MHC2 processing data cannot improve epitope prediction. The unfortunate answer to that is yes. Um, we do not find, and so I guess like in general, I'm always a big fan of Occam's razor. If we don't see a clear improvement, we would do not recommend doing something. That does not mean that those steps aren't important. 
And that does not mean that there might not be ways to predict these things that are uh, successful. Uh, but in general, we are trying to keep things uh, simple and reliable. That's why we are sticking uh, to the recommendation of doing MHC binding predictions by themselves for T cell epitope candidate uh, identification for now. Uh, and I guess like a uh, somewhat selfish thing is um, the more people do that and then we get more data in, the more we can then see, can we actually make an algorithm that builds upon this and get even better. If people, once the people start using these algorithms then we have a pre-selection bias of the epitopes even being tested. So let me stop here. Paolo, you wanna take one? Will, you wanna take one? Yeah, um, I think this is related to TCR match. Uh, there's a question asking, is there any benefit to having single cell CDR sequences versus only bulk immunoprofile sequencing? Um, I would say it, it kind of depends on um, what you're trying to find. Uh, and if there's, um, if you have reason to believe that there are low frequency uh, CDR sequences that uh, are of interest to, um, that you want to find what epitopes those are recognizing, then a single cell might be beneficial there uh, in that situation. But, um, but for, uh, for most purposes, I think bulk immunoprofile will, um, will suffice, but um, it, it does depend on, on what your objectives are, I think. Um, maybe someone else can, can speak to that as well, but that's my take on it. Yes, but if, if I can yeah, add on top of your, or your answer is that basically we also see the same. Uh, there is some information that you can get from having paired alpha and beta chains, uh, for example, using these structural tools, but, well, you, you, in some cases, maybe it's not worth it because they, they, doing single cell sequencing is much more expensive. So you get most of the information from the CDR3 uh, of the beta chain alone. So it really depends on the setup and if you, I mean, can do single cell. There is some information, but it's not huge. And a good point, Paolo, and I think this is a recurring pattern. We always have to be and should be aware of that there's costs associated with things. <laughs> it would be always nice. Why not having full length alpha, beta, shared, paired, and, and why not the transcriptome for all the cells and, and the structure of the epitopes binding the TCR and the MHC. We always want that, but uh, there's uh, realism involved here as well. So. Um, Okay, I'll take two questions. Uh, is the destruction by the processing enzymes of potential ligands an important factor for epitope prediction? And the answer to that is we tried and we did not see anything. So uh, looking for cleavage sites within an epitope as a marker of potential degradation does not seem to be associated with le less immunogenicity or less uh, ligand presentation. So we have not uh, managed to make that into a reliable predictor. The next one is CD4 T cell immunogenicity prediction for combined score, immunogenicity score, and medium seven allele score. What is the scale for all these? Lower value equal higher binder for all three. So the um, I, I'm hoping I'm getting this right. Seven allele definitely lower value is better, but the immunogenicity score I believe higher value is better. So in the combination, and again I refer to the paper, uh, I believe there's a sign flip in there. Uh, when the two are combined and or no, I think it was a rank, first it was a rank calculation and then the rank is reversed for one versus the other before the two are combined. Um, and in general, I, we are trying to answer things here as fast as we can. <laughs> and I would recommend you if these are important to you, it's always good to go back to the primary literature where these things are described. If I don't make a mistake now, I don't want to be sued. Would you like to answer one more question? We are at 11, which is our break. Paolo, or Will? No, not really. There's not much for, for the structural part, so I'm good. Yeah, I think we got through all the TCR match questions as well. Okay, I'll go through the rest of the, in the, in the break. Excellent, all righty. Um, that's me back then. I'd like to thank you, um, Paolo, Will, Bjorn, Austin, before that, um, thank you for your presentations and for answering the questions.
Um, we now are at 11 a.m. Pacific time. So we will take a 30 minute break, um, stretch your legs, have something to eat, and we'll be back at 11.30. So in 30 minutes, I will be sharing um, the survey link for today, day two. Um, feel free, you can open it up and, and start uh, filling it in if you'd like. I will also be sharing the link to some resources that we've put into a Google Drive. Again, I shared it during the short break, but I'll, I'll share it again here. So um, just one more time, 30 minute break, we'll reconvene at 11.30 and I'll be sharing the survey link if you'd like to get started on that as we go through the second half of this session. So thank you all and I'll see you in 30 minutes.